Okay. Yeah, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, on, on where you want? It's on Amazon? Yeah, uh, on Amazon. It's on Amazon. It's on Meta. Does it have the Arabic and English? No. Right. no? I didn't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't so uh, last time we finished up Ajayi we finished up the, the section talking about the marvels of the heart. We're now moving into the next book, and now moving into the next section, which is the so disciplining the soul. And this is something that's really important, it's something that's very fundamental. Um, and as we go along, as we continue along, we'll find that Imam Ghazali. He's building on previous concepts, right? He's building on previous concepts. And as he as he increases, as he builds on these things, we have to make sure that we're keeping the points and the arguments and the introductions that he presented in the first part in order us to help us understand the direction that he's going. Uh, because a lot of times what happens is that people will take Bazadi's work and they'll take sections of it and they'll take it out of context. So whenever we deal with this or whenever we deal with the work, it's very important for us to make sure that we're keeping all of these things in context when we discuss a lot of these things. So what are some things that are really important that we took from the, the last book, right? So this, this is book 22. The book before this is book 21. And the book 21 is actually part of a third part of a larger series. The whole book is Ihya, but Ihya is broken up into four parts. This is actually the third part, uh, or destructive vices. And the reason that I chose this part more so than ibadat, more so than uh, the worship section, is because I feel personally that there are better presentations of fiqh in, in other books, but this is probably one of the best presentations of, of fiskia, one of the best presentations of actually purification that I've seen comparatively in other books. This book has been worked on extensively uh, by other scholars. It's been, there have been people who summarized it, there are people who've added to it, uh, there are people who based their books off of it. And this is the reason why I chose it. This is the next part. This is book 22, alhamdulillah, we completed book 21. And then you can be the now we go to continue on here. And Imam Ghazali, he, brings, he begins with a prologue. He brings, begins with a prologue talking about the importance of character. Why focus on this part? Why is this fundamental? And when we talk about character, when we talk about prologue, well, what comes to mind? And we'll, we'll talk about some of the nusus, we'll talk about some of the texts that actually mention this. But again, what is character? We hear khulaf a lot, right? This is, this is not a new term to us. But what does it mean? It's an essence of a human being. Okay. In, in what, what, like even this, like it, it's, there are some terms that we kind of throw out the sound, right? So I'm sure all of you have heard the word taqwa. Mm. All of you have heard the word salt. Mm. But what do these terms actually mean? How do I actually incorporate them into my life? It, wh what are these? What is a wedding? Right? So these are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned. These are things that the Prophet mentioned. And these are words that I feel we throw around quite a bit. But how many of us truly understand what they mean? We know even with full of, we know that even with character, there is good and there is bad. There's bad character. And what, where do, what do you think Ghazali is going to focus on? The bad one. Right, he's going to focus on the bad. Because by focusing on the bad, he says these are ways to avoid having bad character in order to achieve good. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that he won't talk about this, but there will be a lot of times where he spends a lot of time discussing this. So what does he talk about? He says bad character essentially emanates from the heart. Mm -hmm. Right? He, he's, he's, he's saying this is not a superficial disease. It's not a superficial disease. Bad character shows that there is some type of sickness in the heart. So when we see bad character, this is actually a symptom for a greater disease, for a greater sickness. And here, what he's going to do, he's actually going to focus on these sicknesses. He's going to focus on these illnesses so that we're able to identify them. And then he's going to try and give us some techniques in order to help push those sicknesses away, in order to cleanse those sicknesses from the heart. So he says, for every sickness, there is love. There is a ilaj, there is a treatment. And because it's so important to understand these sicknesses, he even says that because everyone has some form of sickness, this is established. Everybody is sick in some way, shape, or form. He says that seeking treatment is an obligation. Mm -hmm. 
who says this is an obligation. Everybody has to seek treatment in some way, in some shape, or in some form. And that's where he mentions, and he talks about how is that done, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala statement, but up the hamant is meaning that prosperous are those who purify themselves. And this word teskia is something that again we are familiar with. How does that purification happen? How does teskia actually happen? This is what he's going to discuss. This is what he's going to talk about. It's it's not enough for us to just keep using these words between each other. We need to really understand what they are. Because if we understand what they are, we can learn to how to actually apply them. So there are a number of sicknesses, and he will talk about how to deal with them. This this book is broken up into 11 parts. This book is broken up into 11 parts, and this section will continue into those 11 parts. And this is how we're going to be breaking up the book, inshallah, as like, a, you know, as smaller courses. Uh, book 21, which was Ajayb al Quru, or Marvels of the Heart, that was the first part. And this part, inshallah, we're going to talk about Riyadh al Nafs, so we're going to be talking about uh, disciplining the soul. And he mentions these are the things he's going to cover. He's going to talk about the importance of good character, he's going to talk about the nature of good character. Uh, the ability to change, attaining it, refining it, and identifying symptoms of those diseases. He's also going to talk about discovering faults. He's going to talk about renouncing desires. What are some signs of good character? And so basically, the transition from here is the virtue, how to gain it, how to how to clear your heart. And once you've cleared your heart, now you should start showing symptoms of what? Good of good character, right? Because now you've worked your way through and you're working these bad character characteristics or these bad character out of your system, you should now be showing symptoms of good character, showing that there is some type of, uh, there's a change that's happening. What does that tell us about food? Can be nurtured. It can, it can be nurtured and can change. And not just that, there are visible, what? There are visible symptoms. There are visible characteristics that you can actually identify. If I see this in myself, I know that there is progress, there is a, there is a good change, or there's a bad change that's happening. It's because sometimes just analyzing the heart in and of itself, it's very challenging. It's very difficult. And even when doctors, can they actually go to the source? What do they look for? Symptoms. They look for the symptom. And when they see all of these symptoms, then they're actually able to come up with a treatment. And it's very similar with character. Right? If my character is bad, the, for me to judge it, in order for me to gauge where my character is, I, need, I can see some of those symptoms. I can see some of those diseases, and then I can start coming up with a treatment plan. Uh, something he has on disciplining children. Why? How you discipline children? Yeah. Um, How is this related? What does this have to do with everything else that he's talking about? To help them. Make sure they the good and the bad. The, why children? Because they don't know. It's easy for to give them that foundation. Okay. Patience. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Out of all the people, why children? Maybe can that be synonymous to, to the heart? Maybe. Is okay. he trying to use? Uh, this, I had to extend the fever. All right, goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it say? Who? It's a good thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, save yourself and your children or your family from the help. So that, that's why this is connected. And look at what he did here. Who's being saved up until this point? Myself. Yourself, right? Like, and all of you have flown on a plane, right? What, what do they say when the mask drop? Like, you know, save yourself before you help yourself before you help anyone else. Because if you try to help yourself before you've gone through these stages, what's going to happen? Both of you are going to drown. Mm -hmm. and, and then the spiritual struggle, that this is the last one, right? Because he says that you go through all of these stages, you go through all of these changes, then you're actually able to pass it down to your children. Then he talks about the spiritual struggle. Why? Why close with this? So that... Uh... You know that now the journey is long. Okay. If it's continuous, it's continuous. Awesome. Maybe because it's ongoing. Does, does this ever end? No, no. It just never ends. You're constantly in a cycle of analyzing. You're constantly in a cycle of determining the symptoms. You're constantly in a cycle of treating yourself. Just because I have one disease of the heart today, does this mean that once I take care of that disease, I'm not going to have any other ones? No, no, no. Right? Shaitan is constantly trying to attack us. And we had spoken about this in the last book. That Shaitan is going to attack us from different doors. He's going to try to approach us from different ways. And just because this way didn't work for the past three years, it doesn't mean that this one is not going to work for the next one. And because there's, that constant struggle is there, 
this reanalysis needs to happen again and again and again. It's not one time. It's not a one time cure. Even from regular illnesses that we have, it's not that okay. I'm cured from the flu one time. I'm never going to get it again, right? Or I'm not. I'm cured from COVID one time. I'm never going to get it again. So this is the, the first chapter, John. This is what we're going to talk about today. Um, but it's not going to be too long. So. Is this related to the strategy or school? Sorry. Yes. Okay. So it's that it's something have, having this this idea or like you know that internal purification. That's something that's really important, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's really clearing our hearts from all the vices, like clearing our hearts from the evil before we're actually able to go and spread it and able to you know, take care of others. Mm -hmm. So over here, we start off with this. Truly, you have a strong character. Who is this? Being, who is the uh, one addressed in this verse? Uh, this is our beloved messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why is this verse important? Or is it not important? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, Allah just put it there. It's maybe because he, he chose to to describe the both sides and then mm. by his follow not other good uh, characters, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of all the things that he could have described him with, he chose to describe him with the character. What character is something that's really important. We use the word a lot. But what does it mean? And the Prophet says something we know for sure he had it. Yes. We know it. Mm. But what did he have? What did he? What did he have? If we say he had khuluk, okay. what does that mean? And he had good character, right? We'd say Prophet oh, the best of character. He had good character. Kana the Quran. What does it mean that he had good character? What are things that I'm looking for that I know he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had good character? Character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what he says, this is khudr al-afu, wa'amu bi-maru, wa'alayda al-jahmeen. He tolerates and commands what is right. Pay no attention to foolish people. Aisha radiallahu alayhi wa sallam, she said, kana khulukuhu al-Qur'an, that his character was the Qur'an, he embodied it. The Prophet I have been sent to perfect character. Again, we're hearing this word time and time and time again. Uh, the Prophet said, the heaviest thing to be placed on the Nizan are taqwa wa khulaq al hasan in good character. We hear this word repeated again and again and again and again. What are some things that will give us an idea of what khulaq is? From these verses, from these hadith, uh, from these verses, or from this verse, or from the previous verse, from these hadith, how, what is, what is khuluk? Your actions. Okay, it's definitely an action. I can, I, I'm seeing that. But what kind of actions? Okay, good actions. <laughs> MashaAllah, Hassan. <laughs> you hear this place, like, subhanAllah, look how old some of us are. I mean, how often we've heard this thing. And we still cannot define it. It's terrifying. It's nothing to be embarrassed of. I blame the clergy. I don't blame the kids. That we, we've, that we've done. What do you guys think of this? What does this tell us? Well, the apple, what more than model? Oh, what more than the law? That be tolerant and command what is right. What is that telling us about? Be, 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 to, be tolerant with who? With others. Command what is right. Who am I commanding? Myself and others. Are we starting to get into summer now? What the is? How to deal with others? How to deal with others? Very simple. How I deal with others is a gauge on what and how my look and my attitudes are. Who cares? 
Look at all of these now. Does it make more sense? That when he was the embodiment of the Quran, what does that mean? And how he dealt and how he spoke about it. I have been sent only to perfect character. He sallallahu alayhi said, why did people come to Islam? Because he prayed so long? Mm. Huh? Mm. Why did they come to Islam? Because the way he dealt with it. Mm. That's what was attractive about him so much. And why is this the heaviest thing? Because you're not hurting anyone. Right? One of the one of the heaviest things that can work against you is doing dhulm. Right? What, what is oppression? Oppression is hurting others. It can be oppressing yourself, there's no doubt. But it's hurting others. How we deal with others, this is exactly what Qurab is. And if we actually sit down and think on how we deal with others, why is that so reflective? Why does that show what's going on in my heart? Think about it. Is there a connection or no? Like what? Give me, give me an example. If I'm talking down to somebody, if I'm ridiculing somebody, what am I actually doing? How do, what is that I'm reflecting in my heart? That you don't think of yourself highly? Either I, I, think of, I don't think of myself highly, or I what? Or the opposite. I, I, I'm arrogant. Right? Because I think I'm better than the person that I'm ridiculing or making fun of. Because what you're saying, I understand what you're saying. That basically, in order to build yourself up, you need to bring others down. But a lot of that has to do with ego and arrogance. Because the person, he has no value. She has no value. You have no problem moving them out of the way. You have no problem ridiculing them. You have no problem asking them. How we speak to people. How we address people. How we interact with people. Why am I willing to cheat someone? Because I feel it's my right. And this person is less than me. Why am I willing to lie to someone? I have no problem hurting anyone. Like subhanAllah, it's, it's amazing how all of those particular actions reflect back onto the heart of the person and really show what's going on in that person's heart. So why is there so much focus on character? Versus aspects, like specific aspects of worship. Do we have the same type of focus on salah or psalm or zakah? Why so much focus on Quran? To create a healthy society. Ascent, right? Because, I mean, society, the fabric of society is built on character. Society is built on, if people have good character, if I trust you and you trust me, what does that mean? That means now I can do business with you. It means that I have no problem in marrying my son to you or you marrying my daughter to you, right? Because there's trust there. I have no problem working with you, opening a business with you. I have no problem praying with you. Why? Because I don't fear you. This is what good character builds. This is why people wanted to become Muslim because they saw individuals who had good character. And they said, we want to be part of that society. We want to be part of a society where they don't look down on anyone. We want to be part of a society where they give everybody a chance. We want to be part of a society where we do not feel we are less than others, where we're not part of a caste system, where we're not lower, where we're not lesser. To the point where people who were in slavery, some of them wanted to stay slaves because of the rights that they felt they enjoyed. That's what Islam is. That's what character does. It's something that's attractive. Like I said, most people don't come to Islam because they're like, Oh wow, you guys pray five times a day. That's like amazing. Right? Most people don't come to Islam. So, all right, oh, so I just wear two towels and I have to do this journey for five days. Like, you know, if, if you think about it very logically, why are those things attractive? Are they spiritually fulfilling? Absolutely. No, there's no doubt about it. But those actions in and of themselves, many times it's not the reason people come to Islam. They come to Islam and they leave Islam. Think about that. Most people come to Islam and leave Islam because of Muslim. They want to be part of that brotherhood. They want to be part of that system. And that's why they want to embrace this one. And you'll find if you read books like Infidel or Kafir or all of these books that talk about people leaving Islam, why, why is it that most of those people, some of them raped, abused, molested, ridiculed? And you'll find that they, because of their interactions, because of bad character, 
They left us. So it's important for a number of reasons. And we, we had said that our relationship with others can be reflective of our relationship with Allah. How? Because when I'm dealing with you, Joshua, how conscious I am of my Lord, I will ask you a question. What is taqwa? Taqwa is God consciousness. If I'm remembering Allah while I'm dealing with you, while I'm dealing with him, while I'm dealing with her, while I'm at the store, while I'm in the car, while somebody cuts me off, while somebody rips me off, if I'm remembering Allah in all of those situations, would I act the way that I did? Taqwa is having that active consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every single interaction that I have in my day to day life. And what did we say the, the opposite of taqwa was? Love. What is that? It's when I forget Allah, right? The reason that I'm, I, I deal with this person in this way, or that I yelled at him, or that I screamed at him, or that I cursed at him, or that I cut him off, or that I parked illegally, or I did all of these things. Why? Because I didn't remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And look at the damage and the danger that it caused. And look at the relationships that are broken. We can all think in our lives, whether it be ourselves or others, that why those relationships broke is because they didn't remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those, in those US situations. It doesn't mean that we have to maintain every relationship. That's not what I mean. Did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did he maintain every single relationship that he had in his life? No. No, he didn't. Mm -hmm. And is there anyone who can say the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was ever perfect? No. Hashem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent the best of creation as the best example. And the best example didn't have a relationship with every single person. It's not necessary. I don't have to be best friends with everyone who I meet. But Allah obligates me to have taqwa in those relationships, whether they be close or whether they be close. So, like we said, these relationships are reflective of the condition of our heart. Even if I don't like someone, if I dislike someone, can it show my relationship with Allah with how I'm dealing with this person? If I dislike him or her? It should show more. That's when I really have to fight my nose. That's when I really have to fight. If there's someone who I'm, I like, what, what, like, what challenge is there? There's no real challenge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says, He says, when the, belie the believers are a brotherhood, they're a fraternity. What does that mean? That means that they disagree, but they still fight for each other. They still stand up for each other. They still give each other victory, even though they don't agree. Agreement's always easy. Right? That's, that's the easy part. There's no challenge there when I disagree with someone. The challenge comes in when I when I disagree with someone. If there are people who are nice to us, if there are people who are good to us, and we still don't have the ability to be thankful to those people who manna alayna, fadl alayna, those these individuals, they might they helped us and we saw them helping us. If I can't be thankful to, to those people, how can I be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for many times he does things for me that I can't even see? Allah bless me with eyesight. Allah bless me with health. Allah bless me with children. Allah bless me with the job. Allah bless me with the ability to walk. Allah, you know, there's so many things that Allah has blessed me with that are indirect, right? I didn't see Allah put the eyes into my head. I didn't see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me the strength that I got. And these aren't things I, I but people actually giving me money, people actually helping me, and I still can't thank them. What does that show of my heart? And people who aren't thankful, why aren't they thankful? That arrogance. It's, it, it's the only thing. And subhanAllah, the story that is repeated multiple times is the story of the shaitan. Why? Does the shaitan just believe in Allah? No, he believes in Allah. Then what got him thrown into the hell? What got him cursed? His arrogance, his power. Well, it's, I mean, when Allah tells these parables, Allah you have to pay attention. There's a reason Allah shares that story specifically. And how he talks about Shaitan. And how he was righteous. Right? This, that arrogance, it doesn't have to be, you know, we always think of the evil person. Like, right? It's the evil person that is there. No, it doesn't have to be. 
even even somebody who is apparently righteous can be full of error. In Allah. Yeah. So these are some statements that um, uh, Imam Ghazali mentioned. So he says that Sayyid al Junaid, he said, there are four things that lift a man up to the highest degrees, even if his knowledge and his works be unsubstantial. Like he hasn't done a lot. He's not very knowledgeable, but there's still some things that even he can do. He can have forbearance, he can have sabr, he can have hayat, he can have modesty, he can have generosity, karam, or jud, and lastly, he can have good character. This is, he, he's, he's saying that at the least, these are the things anybody can have these characteristics. Anybody can do these. At the least, try to have those. And he said, by these, his faith is made complete. Out of all of these, do you see a lot of worship going on here? No. All, it, even all of these things, this is, if you think about it, there's a receiving party for all of these, yes? Mm -hmm. There's somebody, to, how do I have hayat if nobody's around? How can I show someone if nobody's testing me? How can I be generous if there's nobody to give to me? And how can I show good character if nobody's there? I have to mix with the people. That, that's part of being Muslim. Islam is an extremely metropolitan religion. Extremely. The Prophet said there are many ahadith that he prevented the Bedouins from going back to the Bedouin lifestyle. He would encourage them all to come to Medina and to move into the city. Because Islam is a metropolitan religion. It is a religion where we develop a brotherhood, where we develop society, where we build each other up. And that can't be done when we're all living poverty. Uh, Sayyid al Qatani, he said, Sufism is good character. So anyone who has improved your character has improved your, your Sufism. Mm -hmm. And, and what, do we, what do we say about the Sufism? Last class. What is it? In essence. Yeah. It's tusky. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. However charged this word has been, or however charged this term has been, or however you've heard it before, it's irrelevant. This, this is part of our tradition. It is part of our tradition. And it is the Tezkiya part of our tradition. It is the spiritual part of our tradition. And, it, and we talk, these are the things that are discussed when you don't want to talk about this. This is part of this. This is a fundamental part of this. Not, not just something extra. This is a fundamental part. So this was basically the end of the chapter. This is the end of this discussion, inshallah. As the, as the chapters go on, we're going to discuss more and more things, you know, how to identify good character, how to you know, embody good character, um, you know, what are some actually things that we can do in order to better ourselves and better our relationship with others and better our relationship ultimately with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq, tawfiq, Allah wa ala sallam 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 Junaid al-Baghdad. Yeah, I think this is a Junaid. I think this is a Kitan. Yeah, you're right. I have to change it. Exactly. Plus, if you don't have any questions, then we are done for the evening. Uh, unrelated questions, if there are any. Any questions? Anything wrong that was said? More than welcome to challenge. I enjoy it a lot. <laughs> anything you disagree with? Yeah, okay. bring it. Yeah. What you got? But that's that's an important part of that. That's an important part of discussion. That's an important part of being Islam. Just because somebody tells you something, don't take it like that. Challenge it. Question: Where did this come from? Why is it like that? Prove it. Being in a, being in a position to challenge that's something that's very important. Something that's very famous. Even Ibrahim alayhi salam, he said to Allah, Adini, kept it in And show me how to bring life. Show me how you bring life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered to Allah, how would I tell you? Do you not believe? He said, Bala, kayat my new He said, No, I do. I just want to bring the ease to my heart. Having that healthy skepticism is important. Being able to ask questions is important. Being able to challenge is important. It's a very important part of our religion. Don't be afraid of any questions. Um, so how do you act upon someone who's like wrong? Like, how do you go about that with like having a good character? Sure. So, if some there, I, I think I had spoken about it previously. 
but basically it has to do with forgiveness and understanding what forgiveness is. Number one, it's important to understand forgiveness is a process. All right, forgiveness is not a switch. Somebody's wronged me and they're like, please forgive me. You're like, sure, done. No, it doesn't work like that. It, it takes time. And forgiveness is in parts, right? Forgiveness meaning that I will not hold you accountable in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it doesn't mean I'm going to have a relationship. If, if somebody stole $50 from me, it might not be a lot of money, but I'll make sure that I don't keep money around. I forgive you, meaning that when we stand in front of Allah, I'm not going to ask Allah about that. I'll be like, I forgive you. I forgive you. That's fine. Also, they're putting timelines behind things. If somebody keeps asking me for forgiveness, I can't dangle it over his head or her head. Like, so what happens is instead of him oppressing you, now you become the oppressor because you're hanging the sin over that person's head. That is, SubhanAllah, look, look how fragile these relationships are. And look how dynamics change so quickly. Put a timeline, be like, listen, I can't talk about this right now. Come back to me in a couple of weeks. After a couple of weeks, make a decision. Either you forgive the person or you don't. It's not, you know, it's not rocket science. And if you don't forgive the person, that's your heart. That's your right. You'd be like, listen, I'm sorry, I don't forgive you. Simple. I, I, I can't. So, oh, how can you not forgive someone? What if this person killed your mother? I, I, a very honest question. People who've been raped, were you going to, no, no, you have to forgive? It's not a condition. You can't, you can't, you can't emotionally blackmail people. You can't spiritually blackmail people into forgiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the haq al-afu, he gave the right to forgiveness into the person who's been wronged, not to the other people. If you feel you've been wrong, you have every right to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and complain. And you don't need to have a relationship with that person. Even the Prophet said that when Washi came to him, he said, he said, tell me how you killed the Hamza. And he said, well, you know, he was between the rocks and I saw him dodging like this, and then I threw my spear and it struck him on the stomach. The Prophet said, he, you know, he, he was upset and he said, he said, listen, I can't, I can't see you. I can't look at you. you were, every time I look at you, I'm reminded of my own. Did he have a relationship with him? No. Is it necessary? Absolutely not. Some of his uncles he loved. A lot of he loved him. Very clearly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ka la man And he loved him. He loved his uncle. He had a great relationship with him. And his other uncles, Abu Lahab, had a terrible relationship. Or people like Abu Jahl, terrible relationship. What did he do? He just ignored them. He didn't deal with them. So how? So that's how you have good character. Good character doesn't mean that I'm a doormat. Right? This is, I think this is a misunderstanding a lot of people have. That good character means that I'm a doormat. If you wrong me, all right, just, you know, it's okay, just step all over. No, that's not how it works. Good character means to be upright too. It means to be strong. It means to know what your boundaries are and not letting people take advantage. Mm -hmm. Right? Even when the angels come to those who die, they say, Kudna They said, oh man, we were weak and we were oppressed. And the angel said to them, Alam to was. It's like, was Allah's earth not wide enough at Tahajjah so that you can make Hijrah and leave that place where you're being oppressed? How can you allow yourself to be oppressed? It's an amazing thing about Islam. Not only are we not allowed to oppress people, we're not allowed to put ourselves in situations where we're being oppressed. And if we are the victims, who's who's to blame? The victim. That's it. Unless you are forced, right? Meaning the next ayah talks about except those who are weak and the women, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if you have a choice to get out of that situation and you don't take it, you are the only one to blame. No one else. Any other questions? So um, a lot of times within the community, mm -hmm. I will see name and that, right? So do you. Yeah. And then we stay the heck out of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So how then can we merge of not the community getting entangled with just terminologies yeah. that they actually don't know the reality behind it uh -huh. and actually kind of benefit from ask, despite it. You know, you have to ask. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, the, the thing is, I've had, um, I've had brothers who say, okay, like, we need to protect our belief. We need to protect our, I've, I've heard this before. My question is usually, okay, how did you reach the aqidah that you're on right now? Mm -hmm. The one that you reached right now, how did you get to this point? Not By sure. questioning and challenging. Mm -hmm. And if what makes an aqidah an aqidah? What makes a belief a belief? That it stands up to? The truth. It stands up to scrutiny. Any type of scrutiny, anything that you bring at that belief, what's going to happen? Gonna it's going to have an answer. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't have an answer, what does that mean? It's, not it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Very simple. If you are believing in something and somebody brings something to challenge it, 
And this, I'm not saying you as an individual, because sometimes we don't have the answers. But if that belief system, that belief structure doesn't have an answer, you know what that means? Well, that that belief is wrong. And what do I mean by all of this? Meaning that if we, we can't, by you getting to a point, I'm questioning, 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 questioning. Okay, no, no, this is the truth. I'm not going to, I'm going to stop questioning now. What is that? All that, it's just a belief. Nothing else. It's just blindfold. Because you've reached a point now where you're not questioning anymore. And the only person who doesn't question is Muqallim. Is the Muqallim. Mm -hmm. And, and look, at, look, look at Allah. Is Allah so petty that he would allow you to come to the truth? He'll bring you all of this way, this whole journey. He's bringing you all the way here, and then he's going to misguide you? Does Allah play with the people? Is our Lord like that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Hey, well, sometimes I don't, I don't understand like how, how people even have such thoughts. You really think Allah's going to lead you astray? Allah brought you all this way, and now he's going to lead you astray? Wait, he's, Allah's playing with you? Allah's petty? Allah's joking? Is it, like, can you even imagine? Like, my Lord is greater than that. So when it comes to new terminologies or things that we aren't familiar with, we question, we ask. Where did that come from? Why is it like this? Where did that come? You know what I mean? Who said that? What is it? Or what does that mean? Mm. Or I don't agree with that. That's fine too. Well, this, that sounds strange. Like, okay, what sounds strange? Let's talk about it. See, the only way. And you know, you know, <laughs> subhanAllah, you know what the fundamental to all of this is? Good <laughs> khulub. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Having husband with your brother. Mm -hmm. yeah, anybody who talks about Islam, you think they're talking about it because they're they hate it? Right? A person who's talking about they're talking about it because they love it. They might not understand it correctly. They might be ignorant. They might be, you know, what I mean, whatever the case might be, but at least have enough respect that you you're willing to challenge this person. And how do you know when this person doesn't know? Or if this person like when he's not unable to explain what he's talking about. Very simple. If he starts talking about people, then you know there's a problem right there. Because this is not a manhaj nabi. This is not how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did now. If you want to find out if a person's on the truth or falsehood, very simply, does he talk about ideas or does he talk about people? Mm. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa his dawah is one that brings people together. And if the person you're talking to or the person you're listening to is just separating people, then you know that this is not the prophetic way. Whenever people would go to the Prophet and they would go under him and they would respect him and they would sit down and they would listen to him. Why? Because they knew he was being honest and he was being truthful and he could be challenged. How many people came to him and challenged the Prophet Did he say anything? No. Even from his companion, they would disagree. But then what happened? Ahmad was like, no, I don't think we, we should kill these guys. We shouldn't have answered. Even, even the Prophet wasn't above being uh, criticized. Because that's the nature of our deen. So, yeah, being open hearted is something that's really important. Almost my guidance is in Allah's hands. I don't need to protect my hidayah. You know why? Because Allah's already protected. Mm -hmm. And if I wanted to, can I? Sure. Can I protect? Do I have the ability to protect my hidayah and my guidance? No, actually not. I don't. The only thing, you know, the only thing that we can protect? Ignorance. That's the only thing you can protect. You know how to protect it? By not asking. You want to stay jahil? No problem. Just stop questioning. Stop asking. I guess uh, see everybody next week in China.